4,000 World Health Organization researchers. And he mailed them all a floppy disk. This was his like get rich quick scheme based on nature. This is a picture of the floppy disk that he mailed them, AIDS information. So of course at the time AIDS had just become this big epidemic, researchers were studying it, everybody wanted to open this. And they popped it into their computers and when they ran, uh, when they did, they got this pop-up that said, Dear customer, it is time to pay for your soft release from the PC Cyborg Corporation. Complete the invoice and attach payment for the lease. And then they actually had you mail a check to Panama. I don't know exactly what Dr. Pop was planning here, but he thought he was going to be getting a bunch of checks for $189 mailed to a P.O. box in Panama, where I guess he was going to just cash out and live happily ever after. Turns out it it wasn't very hard to track this down. Uh, the attack was very quickly traced down to him. He was ex extradited to the United States where he was declared mentally unfit, unfit for trial. So that is the beginning of ransomware. Times have changed since then. Obviously, it's not your grandma's ransomware anymore. And um, what we have seen today is not just malware that locks up all your data, of course, but we're seeing data exfiltration, threats to leak data, denial of service attacks. So in this talk and also in our book, we discuss not just ransomware, but really cyber extortion in general, any threats to the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of information. Okay, I jumped a little bit ahead and didn't tell you who we were, so let's back up a second. Who is this person speaking at you? My name is Sherry Davidoff. I'm the CEO of LMG Security, and I've been in the industry for 23 years. Um, along with Matt, I'm the co-author of Ransomware and Cyber Extortion, and I've written two other books as well. And I think my claim to fame is that the New York Times called me a security badass once. That's like <laughs> my biggest life achievement. Uh, Matt, take it away. Talk about yourself. Uh, yeah, so uh, nice to meet everyone. My name is Matt Duran. I'm the Director of Training and Research for LMG security. <clears throat> I have not been in uh, cybersecurity as long as Sherry by, by any stretch, but uh, you know, I try to keep up. Uh, but yeah, we, uh, we, we're really excited to be here, and uh, Ransomware, honestly, is, is kind of a, uh, a, a passion project of ours. We've, uh, we've been uh, working through <laughs> Ransomware cases and dealing with this, these kind of cyber attacks for years. Uh, put it all into our book, and so if you'd like to, Go ahead and swing by our booth after the talk. We're actually going to be doing a book signing starting right as soon as we get done here, which was supposed to be at noon, but a little bit after. Uh, we'd love to see you guys come by. Thanks, Matt. So today we're going to start off by talking about MGM, uh, the big ransomware case that we've gotten a lot of questions about lately. We'll discuss the impacts of cyber extortion, and then we're going to walk you through a couple more case studies and a demo. We'll talk about the royal ransomware gang, the anatomy of a ransomware attack, and a demo from our laboratory where the elite giraffe gang hacks Hack Me Inc. And then finally, we're going to uh, conclude by talking about the top security controls of 2023. We want to make sure that we're giving people consistent recommendations on what to do for both response and prevention. Um, and so we'll conclude with that. All right. So last month, of course, hackers took down MGM. And for those of us who were just in Vegas, this was like a shock. How many of you were in Vegas for Hacker Summer Camp, by the way? Yeah, it was super fun. And I was like, did I party with the person who did that? Um, but no, it turned out uh, that it was a well-known ransomware gang linked to Alpha V and Scattered Spider. And it caused a system-wide outage at MGM. So everything was down. You can see on the screen here, the uh, gambling machines were down. Cash only at restaurants. I honestly can't even imagine that. Can't can't get into your room with the digital room key. Half the time that doesn't work for me anyway, so whatever. The websites were down, the TVs were down. I, I don't even know what people would do anymore at that point. So this was extremely impactful, of course, for MGM, and they did their best to muddle through. But a couple nuances about this case that are very indicative of the trend today. Number one, it wasn't just lack of availability, right? The hackers also made a point of stealing information and threatening to release it to the world. And you can see on the screen here, this is Alpha V. And we can never be sure that the hackers that claim that they hacked somebody actually did. By the way, that's a problem. Um, but anyway, they said, we posted a link to download any and all exfiltrated materials up till September 12th, blah, blah, blah. Um, and they were trying to get a big payout by threatening to release this data, which unfortunately for them did not work. They also said, we still continue to have access to some of MGM's infrastructure. So the importance of threat hunting is really, it cannot be understated. 
Okay, so then because of that, MGM had to disclose a data theft. And again, this is part of the playbook that we see all the time. So this is a screenshot of a letter that was sent to employees. And in that letter, they said that employees, um, oh, sorry, criminal actors obtained certain personal information belonging to some customers, including name, contact info, gender, date of birth, and driver's license. And then also a limited number of social security numbers and passports. I do wonder why MGM had social security numbers for customers. I'm sure there was a good reason. Know your customer verification. Know your customer verification. That makes sense. Also, some employee <coughs> usernames and passwords. Um, and so they had to announce a data breach because of this. This is part of a growing trend. What you're seeing on the screen here are statistics from the Beasley Cyber Insurance Company. I was just actually at one of their conferences. And you can see that over the past few quarters, somewhere between 80 to 95% of incidents have had data exfiltration as a component. These are specifically cyber extortion incidents. So gone are the days when people could say, oh, ransomware, IT just comes and cleans it off. Pretty much every ransomware case you see, you have to treat it as though it's a potential data breach. Exposure extortion, in my opinion, is here to stay. And if you think about it, it's a lot of work to deploy ransomware and then keep track of the keys and try to unlock it. The criminals end up basically having to do customer support for their victims. And in fact, a lot of times when we're working with these criminal gangs, it sure feels like they are like professional customer support specialists. Like they'll help you troubleshoot the decryptor and things like that. Um, or one, one time they actually said, tell us what country you're from. And <laughs> It seemed like they were gathering statistics on their performance. So anyway, ransomware is complex. When you think about the ROI on data theft, it is much higher. All they have to do is steal some data and then threaten to release it to the world, and they're done, right? Um, we've even had cases where we're pretty sure they didn't actually steal information. They were just fooling. Um, but out of an abundance of caution, the ransom was actually paid, and sometimes that's covered by cyber insurance. So it's much, much easier, likely to remain widespread. Okay, we're also starting to see um, much much quicker disclosures, in part because of the new SEC guidelines that say you must disclose within four business days. That's huge. We already were getting some visibility, but four business days means there's really not a whole lot of time to do an investigation, to rule out an issue. In the case of MGM, we just got handed a lot of information about the financial impact very, very quickly after it happened. In fact, I can't remember a case uh, before where we got an estimate so quickly. Um, they estimated overall it would be a $100 million loss, and that included both the operational outage as well as fees. The fees included legal fees, um, tech consulting fees. When you have a ransomware or cyber extortion case, the immediate impact seems huge, but often that's just the tip of the iceberg from a cost perspective. So in the case of MGM, their Q3 expenditure was $10 million, but again, they're estimating that another 90% of that will be happening in the future after the fact. We also see other consequences that are not as easy to, me to measure. The Ponemon Institute had a great report last year about the medical effects of ransomware and other types of cyber extortion cases. So check this out. When a healthcare facility gets hit with ransomware, 64% of the time there's delays in, in care, uh, and excuse me, delays in procedures and tests that have resulted in poor outcomes. So boom, right there. It's hard to quantify, but you see that occurring. There's a longer length of stay, which which means it's more costly. And the one that's most frightening is that it leads to increased mortality in patients as well. So literally ransomware can be a life or death situation. We also see layoffs and resignations. Um, in legal and retail, the number of organizations that do layoffs after a ransomware attack is close to 50%. And in other industries, it's still very significant. We also see 32% of organizations hit by ransomware lose their top leadership, e either because they resign or because they're fired. And of course, we also see lawsuits, both for privacy reasons and because of the operational impact. So I think all of us have been seeing privacy lawsuits for a while, and a lot of them do get thrown out because the uh, victims can't, can't show harm. What happened in the UAS, UHS case is that multiple patients sued. Many of those were not allowed to continue because they couldn't show harm, but one patient was able to demonstrate that he suffered financial damage because he was scheduled for a surgery. That surgery got delayed because of a ransomware 
cyber attack, he no longer had the same insurance coverage, and so he could calculate the difference in financial costs, and so his lawsuit was allowed to proceed. So we're seeing many different types of lawsuits, a lot of gray areas, some conflicting rulings, um, which means everything's up in the air right now, legally speaking. Okay, the total revenues generated by ransomware have been going up and up and up. And you can see already in 2023, the revenues that the criminals are making are significantly higher than the year before. Of course, it's hard for us to track ransomware revenues and how much money they're making. For those of you following CERCIA, the new federal incident reporting law that will go into effect in the next year or two, um, soon we will be required to report ransomware payments within 24 hours if you're part of critical industry. And as a result of that, CISA will be producing quarterly reports that give us statistics. So even though it's a little scary to think, hey, we're going to have to report ransom payments in 24 hours, that is going to give us a lot more visibility into how big this industry really is. Okay, so how did the MGM hack happen? It was a social engineering attack. We're actually seeing a lot of ransomware and cyber extortion cases beginning this way. According to Bloomberg, it was a social engineering attack on the company's help desk. And MGM has not confirmed a lot of these details, um, but according to a former MGM employee, the help desk was vulnerable to an attack because it was too easy to do a password reset for someone who calls in. The good news is that MGM was using multi-factor authentication, so even if you could reset somebody's password, no worries, no sweat, they still have uh, MFA on their phones, right? Uh, wrong. Um, attackers are calling help desks and pretending that, hey, I lost my phone, uh, I, need, I need my multi-factor authentication to be reset. And this is called a cross-tenant impersonation attack. It's a trend that Okta has been warning about for a while. In fact, Okta has uh, published a whole blog post on it several months ago. IT service desks are targeted, so your help desk may be targeted. Think about how you verify those employees when they call in, particularly if they call in and need a multi-factor authentication system reset. And then once they were in the system, of course, the hackers were then able to add new accounts and promote other users, remove multi-factor authentication. Those are the typical things that they're going to do once they're inside. According to journalists, the MGM attack was drop dead simple, and this is an organization that invests a ton in cybersecurity, but they said, uh, based on what the hackers told them, all Alphavi did was hop on LinkedIn, find an employee, and call the help desk, a 10 minute conversation. Again, MGM has not confirmed this. Um, to wrap up our discussion of social engineering, another big trend we're seeing and a reason this is successful is because of the prevalence of caller ID spoofing. So this is spoof card. At LMG, we actually do social engineering testing and we like to use spoof card to change your voice, to, to do caller ID changes. Um, there's also many other similar tools like this. The FBI came out with their annual report recently on crime statistics and warned that um, there's an increasingly prevalent tactics, in this case by business email compromise actors of spoofing legitimate business numbers to confirm fraudulent banking details with victims. So we're seeing more and more caller ID spoofing in different contexts. And of course, over the next few years, we're going to have to worry about voice cloning. Um, I think you need now, what is it, 30 seconds of audio in order to be able to clone somebody's voice. So I guess anybody watching this presentation on the internet can now clone my voice. Great. <laughs> Um, but there are strong ways to verify callers. Uh, one that many of my bank clients use is just to integrate with a multi-factor authentication system like Okta, so you can actually have a PIN sent to the person's phone and read to you uh, over the phone, um, which I think is a pretty decent uh, way to do it. And then also there's tools like Pindrop that will actually sample the audio in the background of the call and link it and uh, check a database of known fraudulent uh, call samples to see if it matches matches, things like that. So they're actually doing audio analysis and looking at call metadata and things like that. So bottom line, we need to be training our, our employees. We need to be including things like voice social engineering, MFA, in order to resist these extortion attacks and other types of attacks. Finally, attackers, another trend we're seeing, which came up in MGM, is that attackers are kneecapping virtualization. So in the MGM attack, uh, their ESXi servers were allegedly encrypted by the ransomware gang. So Matt, I'll turn it over to you to go through some of these details. Perfect. Yeah, so when we're talking about uh, the, the prevalence of going after hypervisors specifically, I mean, this has become a big trend, and we're seeing a lot of ransomware groups go for this. There's good reasons why they would do that, though, and uh, MGM, unfortunately, felt the brunt of this. The, uh, the ESXi host, they 
they were running actually managed most of those critical systems inside their network. So their players club, their hotel uh, uh, reservation system, their phones, those were all virtual systems. And the attackers really took these things down to like the base bare metal level. I mean, they annihilated these, uh, these ESXi hosts, which is, is pretty nasty. So why go after a hypervisor? Well, when you think about it, it actually makes quite a bit of sense why you would want to go after a system like that. First off, we all use them. I mean, everyone is moving towards virtualization as kind of the default in their environments. Now, how many of you run all bare metal servers inside of your environment? I'd be surprised if I saw very many hands come up, right? Yeah, everybody's moving towards things like VMware, towards uh, things like Hyper-V, towards ESXi. I mean, there's, there's reasons why we do this. The other thing, too, is that those ESXi hosts, those, uh, those virtualized uh, uh, hosting platforms, are usually a lot more powerful than just a standard workstation. They've got a lot more RAM, they've got a much more powerful processor set. It makes sense why the attackers would want, would want to go for that, a lot more efficient on their part. And finally, if they can take down a hypervisor at a root level, that means they don't have to go through and encrypt every single computer inside your network one by one by one. They don't have to do a massive software push, they don't have to deal with something like PS Exec. They can just hit the hypervisor, take everything down in one fell swoop. That also means, from an investigation standpoint, I can't get data off of any of those hard drives anymore because everything is encrypted all the way down to the uh, the, the kernel level. That uh, that sucks for me. Uh, and we have an example of this actually happening. So uh, the Royal Ransomware Group has been pretty prolific as of late. They are one of the bigger names uh, when we when we talk about modern ransomware up there with Black Hat and Alpha V, uh, Lockbit, and some of the other more kind of you know notorious uh, names that we hear in the industry. We were working with a state government agency, and they had about 5,000 individual users. They had a big ESXi farm that was hosting a lot of their infrastructure, their domain controllers, their file servers, application servers, their Citrix environment, and then most importantly, they had their backup system hosted in a virtualized platform. Uh, that is a mistake for any of you who are thinking about doing that, so, so please don't do that. When we talk about immutable backups, we want really immutable backups, not something where if I take out your hypervisor, I also kill your backups, which we'll, we'll get to that here in just a second. So let's talk about the attack. As we see in a lot of cases, this really started with a phishing email. Social engineering and ransomware tend to go kind of hand in hand. They are, they're like peas and carrots. Uh, and the other problem that we ran into here was another very common issue. The attackers were able to get into the network, they were able to uh, exploit local administrator credentials on a single computer at first, but... All the local admin credentials were the same all the way across the network. Uh, again, very, very common mistake that we find. Our pen testers find this one very, very frequently as well, and it is just a death knell to an environment once this, uh, once this gets hit. Uh, once they hit there, they were able to get into an IT manager's computer, scrape a locally stored clear text password file that had the SSH credentials for their hypervisor system. So now they're not even logging in with a graphic interface anymore. They're not going through the browser, they're just going straight in through SSH. They have root level access on this device. Uh, uh, and then they, uh, they they went ahead and uh, kind of locked out the uh, the attack or the uh, the regular users at that point. So. One of our big recommendations here, if you're able to, because this is not always as easy as it sounds, is to include things like your root level hypervisors in your security program. Uh, in a lot of cases, though, there may not be an EDR or an antivirus agent that you can actually drop on that system. <clears throat> Pretty common, actually. I mean, they're, they're really not built for that kind of, uh, that kind of work. And uh, also, in a lot of best practice uh, configurations, those hypervisors are excluded from things like AV scans in the first place, mainly because we don't want to interfere with them, we don't want to brick the system, and we don't want a bunch of unnecessary uh, resource draining software running on those hosts. It makes sense. I, I used to be in IT. I get it. But uh, we, we still need to keep an eye on those. So uh, make sure that you're able to catch issues quickly there. And uh, you know, make sure you're not leaving those things out in the cold. So this brings up another trend that we're seeing in a lot of our, uh, in a lot of our ransomware cases. Uh, and that is the basic practice of the hackers locking people out of systems. This is, uh, you know, passwords being changed. It is network configurations being changed. There's a lot that can happen here to keep someone who is, uh, who is responding to a ransomware attack from being able to actually respond. Uh, in this case, the attackers got in and they changed the passwords for every user. They had their own user password set up at this point, and uh, they, were, uh, they were basically in control of the entire network. The IT staff had no way of actually getting in. Uh, the other thing, too, they securely deleted those virtual backups uh, all the way down to the root level of the drive. So at this point, again, it did not matter that the, uh, the victim at this point actually, on paper, had a pretty robust immutable backup system. The attackers didn't need to worry about that because they went underneath that backup and just took it out of the hard drive. Uh, this, is, this is a bad place to find yourself if, uh, if you couldn't imagine that. The Royal Ransomware Gang, one of the things I think is funny about them is they have value 
services. Whoops. Um, so for example, if you look at the Roy Royals website on the dark web, this is their contact form, and they say, fortunately, we got you covered. Royal offers you a unique deal for a modest royalty. <laughs> uh, for our pen testing services, we will not only provide you with an amazing risk mitigation service, blah, 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 but also a security review for your systems. So sometimes you can pay a little extra, and the attackers will give you a security review, or, or it might even be included. Um, you don't want the hackers to be the ones pen testing you. It's better to have a real penetration test ahead of time, uh, not after the fact. So that's one of our top recommendations. All right, so tell us about the damage, Matt. All right, so yeah, let's go over the damage. Uh, really quick, though, I, I do want to point out, we did do a, a negotiation with the Black Hat uh, ransomware group at one point, and they did send us one of those pen test yes. reports. Uh, pretty thorough. Uh, we, we actually got a pretty good idea of what was happening on the yeah, network. The formatting now, was crap. The, the formatting sucked, but, and it cost like $750,000, so I mean, a regular pen test <laughs> better, but yeah. Anyway, sorry, tangent there. Uh, so the damage. Uh, the local backups inside of this network were completely annihilated. These guys were dead in the water. Uh, all the other hosts on the network, their domain controller, their app server, their file server, all this stuff is just dead at this point. Machines won't boot, we can't collect evidence. I mean, this is, this is pretty rough. And now we're in the situation where we're likely going to need to rebuild their entire network from the root hypervisor level all the way up to fully functional. That's a big lift, especially for a 5,000 person organization. I mean, that's, that's going to take quite a bit of time. This brings us up to why we need to focus on backup so much as a means of both proactive uh, security and, well, recovery from ransomware attacks. If we are using true immutable backups, ideally off-site completely, that gives us the ability to recover from even some of the most catastrophic style of attacks. If the, uh, God forbid, the burning uh, or the building burns down or something like that, we still have our infrastructure available, especially if we have like a replication site or some kind of, uh, you know, nice DR switchover we can, uh, we can jump into. Configuration does matter, too. If you think you have immutable backups, please test that. Make sure they are truly immutable. If you're not testing your backups, you don't have backups. Pretty simple concept there. Now, in this case, our victim actually got lucky. And this is not something that we run into very frequently. We were very happy to find this. They actually had a decommissioned ESXi system that they had, uh, they had moved off into IT storage about a month before the attack actually happened. So this is sitting completely offline, just collecting dust in an IT storage closet. This is great news for us, because now we have a ton of that data that was now encrypted that we could get back. Not all of it. They're still, we're still losing about 30 days worth of data at this point, which is significant. I mean, that's, that's going to be a problem, but it's now much less less of a problem. It also meant we didn't have to buy a decryptor from the Royal Ransomware Group to get those systems back online, which is, uh, which is pretty nice when we're, uh, when we're talking about you know, an overall ending for the victim. So this brings up another thing that we wanted to talk about here, and that is the importance of conducting actual response training. This is something that the victim in this case had not done, and their IT staff kind of had to shoot from the hip a bit when we were getting into the initial parts of this response. That's not where you want to find yourself when you're in a very, very high stress, uh, high severity situation like this. You want to be rehearsed, you want to be practiced, understand your incident response plan, understand who does what, make sure that you can move through a situation like this as efficiently and smoothly as you possibly can. I mean, it's not going to be easy, but it's good to practice. You know, I think one thing we've seen recently is the importance of acknowledging shadow IT when you're doing tabletops. How many of you have a shadow IT or one or more shadow IT groups in your organization? Yeah. So the problem is you go through a tabletop exercise thinking everything is centralized and then push comes to shove. Um, there was a public entity recently uh, that we worked with that had a major ransomware issue and they had shadow IT that did not want to give them the password to the backup system. It was totally a political issue. Um, it delayed them for weeks, and eventually they got it sorted out. There was some HR, uh, HR <laughs> issues that came out of that. <laughs> um, but the bottom line is make sure you're including shadow IT. You're being realistic when you're doing these tabletop exercises. I like how you describe the threat of physical violence as an HR issue. Oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, so now it's time to see what happens in our laboratory. So we wanted to do a demo for you guys and just sort of take a ransomware attack all the way from beginning to end, or really to the extortion point. Um, so in this case, we have set up a organization called HackBee Inc. HackBee Inc. manufactures widgets. If you can't tell, we pick on HackBee Inc. in our laboratory a lot. Um, very important widgets, and they also serve the public, so they have 24-7 uptime requirements, and they also, of course, collect highly sensitive customer data, so there's a risk of data exfiltration, um, because for some reason you need PII in order to manufacture widgets. So that's HackBee Inc. HackBee gets hit with a ransomware attack. Hack. 
As we're gonna go through this, um, you'll meet two people at Hack Me Inc. One is Leah Ability, she is their finance clerk, and the other is Just In Time, our IT administrator. So Leah, of course, has unprivileged access uh, to the environment. Obviously, she has access to sensitive data, but nothing special from an IT admin perspective. And then Justin has the keys to the kingdom. And let's meet your criminals. We decided the Leet Giraffe Gang would be our criminal gang. They're about to strike. And uh, as part of that, there's the Radman in LMG's laboratory. Wow, he looks familiar. Criminals. <laughs> um, okay. So this is our anatomy of a ransomware attack. And by the way, um, anybody want a cyber slap bracelet? We have, instead of handouts, little wrist outs. That's right, Spike, nice to see ya. Uh, boom, Yay. they're also at our booth. You can stop by our booth afterwards and I think we have like a couple hundred of them. Um, okay, so you can see on these uh, wrist outs, the anatomy of a cyber extortion attack. We start with entry, we go to expansion, appraisal, um, priming, leverage, and extortion. So what this is trying to illustrate is that from the point of entry, you actually have often quite a bit of time to detect the attackers before they actually hold you hostage. It's a whole process for them, an opportunity for you. So where do we want to start? First of all, we started off by looking for a remote access Trojan. How are we going to get into the environment? We're going to find that rat and install it. And in this case, we are going to install it with a phishing attack. Yep. Um, this is, let's see, which one was this? The X-worm rat. This is written in Rust. And that's another trend we're seeing of these evasive programming language that uh, can run cross-platform that are very fast. Um, there was a headline last year that Black Hat, the Black Hat gang was uh, looking to rewrite their code in Rust. I know, Matt, you were just reading this news article this morning. Yeah, I mean, it's it's one of the, uh, again, it's one of the trends that we're seeing. Uh, similar to when, anybody remember the Zeus banking Trojan? Am I, am I dating myself here? There's, there's a couple hands I see up. Okay, so the Zeus banking Trojan's kind of like the grandfather of all brain, uh, banking and information stealing Trojans. Uh, it was, uh, it was uh, built and released by a hacker named Hamza Bendelage, uh, also known as the smiling hacker. If you ever look at uh, news articles with him, he's always got this big grin on his face. Uh, but when he realized he was about to be uh, apprehended by federal law enforcement, he released that source code publicly, and because of that, we saw this explosion in the number of banking Trojans. Trickbot, Emotet, uh, Goznim, all of the big names that you think of when you think of information stealing Trojans have their genesis in that Zeus source code. And we're seeing a kind of resurgence of that pattern with Rust-based information stealers. There's a ton of them that are out there, some of them just on GitHub even, uh, and attackers are grabbing the source code, modifying it to fit their needs, and then using it to, uh, to do things like evade antivirus, uh, to evade EDR software in some cases, to, and again, to run cross platform Platform. It can run on Linux, it can run on a Mac, it can run on a Windows PC. I and mean, there's, there's a, a lot of, uh, of, of useful uh, kind of, uh, uh, well, uses for that kind of software. So let's get started here. How, how do we actually get something like a remote access Trojan onto a network? Well, we went ahead and went with the same way that most attackers do. We just sent a phishing email. Uh, and in this case, you can see exactly what that looks like. We have accounts underscore payments at yahoo.com, but we're gonna spoof that to a name that the you know, victim probably recognizes at this point. That's trivial and easy to do. And we're gonna include something like a Word document. Microsoft Office documents, especially OneNote uh, uh, links at this point, are really, really prevalent in dropping these kinds of, uh, of pieces of software on the network. So uh, there's, our, there's our maldoc. And in the back end of this thing, uh, or I'm sorry, when, when we open it, it's, it's gonna look something like this. And if you've worked in cybersecurity or even worked with email for a while, you've likely seen a document like this pop up at one point or another. Uh, it's gonna say something like the operation didn't complete successfully because this was created in an online version of Word or you need admin access or something. Realistically, what they're trying to get you to do is hit that enable content button at the top of the uh, of the banner. Uh, a reminder, don't click that, ever. Please don't. Otherwise, you and I have to have a much different conversation than we're having today, and I'd really rather not. Uh, once we click that button, that's going to hit some VB script that I have embedded in the document. That's going to reach out to the internet, grab my payload, drop it onto the computer, and just like that, we are now infected. And you can see my little proxy servers. I, I ran this through any.run just to, to get some nice visuals for it. Uh, but we ran through the US for one of our servers, and then I ran through two proxies in Germany uh, at this point, which was, uh, was kind of fun to do. 
Now, once we have the, uh, that initial foothold on the uh, device, we, uh, we get a view from the attacker side of our victim computer, and we can get just basic shell access. Right now, if I just run a who am I, you can see that I am the uh, hack me domain user Leia, Layability. <clears throat> this means that now I have access. Uh, and I can, uh, I can use that access to do any number of things. Uh, mostly what I want to do, though, is uh, steal data, establish persistence, and then move throughout the network in a much wider fashion. So let's see what that looks like. Oh yeah, so I've got username, I've got IP address, I've got my, uh, my Windows version, I've got my privilege level, and uh, then I've got my, my interactive shell. So one of the very first things I'm gonna do, and I'm, I'm modeling this off of the playbook of a pretty infamous ransomware group. We'll tell you who that is here in just a second, but the very first thing I wanna do is gain persistence outside of that remote access Trojan. Now despite the fact that this is written in Rust, it's gonna evade antivirus, it's gonna be tough to see, I can't guarantee that nobody's gonna notice a piece of unauthorized software running on the network. So instead, I'm gonna drop a piece of legitimate remote access software. In this case, I'm going to use the Splashtop uh, streamer. And I can just send a direct uh, command line uh, 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 command over to this computer, install the streamer, and now I've got full RDP access instead of having to worry about going through the shell and going through my remote access Trojan. It's a you know, pretty standard way of going about things. This was not detected by any anti antivirus or anti-malware, and you can see three of them here. Sorry, my eyes are not that great. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're fine. Um, but, uh, yeah. You can see three of them here. I think it was, um, we ran it through Virus Total, yep. and it didn't find it at all. Uh, did we run this one through Windows Defender? Yeah, we ran we Microsoft did. Defender, which unsurprisingly did not catch any of it. Yeah, and that's uh, unfortunately not that uncommon. That's why you need EDR to level up. Yeah, the other one was Bit Defender. Bit Defender didn't catch this one either. But yeah, we, we saw nothing. And a lot of that has to do, again, with the fact that we're using a Rust-based info stealer here. The way that Rust packages their programs uh, means that signature-based identification becomes incredibly difficult. It's not the same as a virus that's written in C or something like that, uh, those, those signatures just flat out don't really exist, which means, again, our traditional model of antivirus software is reasonably ineffective against these types of malware. It's why we need EDR software. The other trend we're seeing a lot of is that hackers are just using legitimate tools. And um, Matt was referencing the, uh, the group that we're modeling this after. Three guesses. Uh, what group is this? Anybody know for a slap bracelet that we're modeling this off of? What ransomware gang? Is that... Do you say Conti Bear? Cozy bear. Oh, bear. bear. Close. Yeah. There's one in particular that leaked a playbook. Conti. Yay! Conti. There you Thank go. you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> thanks for being an interactive audience. I can't quite see you guys. Um, yeah, this is based on the Conti playbook, and we actually have a screenshot a little later, but Conti's playbook actually got dumped to the world, and you could see that they were actually distributing legitimate tools. Any.run was one, yep. uh, which means that it's going to be harder to catch them with things like antivirus software. So again, that's why EDR is so important. You really need to level up and do behavioral-based analysis and things like that, and not just rely on signatures. Um, so our next phase of the cyber extortion attack is expansion. Um, what uh, the elite giraffe gang did here was they started scanning the network to see what other opportunities they had to expand. So Matt, yeah. take it away. Yeah, and in this case, I'm not going to do anything loud and obnoxious like use uh, Nmap or anything like that. I'm just going to use a, another piece of IT software. I'm just going to use Advanced IP Scanner. It's free, it's lightweight, it's easy to use, and again, it's legitimate software. It's signed by a legitimate company. It's probably not going to set off any uh, antivirus software uh, alerts, so that's going to give me a pretty good view of the network. And you can see what I'm pulling back here. I'm pulling back the, uh, the open shares, the host names, the IP addresses, and and uh, the MAC addresses of all the devices on the network. Again, uh, this is one that we find in a lot of aftermath when we do ransomware investigations. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to scrape some credentials off of this computer. And the, uh, the Conti playbook itself uh, will we'll reference the software to use here, but uh, I, uh, if I drop something like Mimikatz on a computer like this, I mean, it's going to light up like a Christmas tree. Any antivirus software, even Windows Defender, is going to catch that. I don't want that, right? I want to be able to you know, stay in the network for as long as I can. So instead, if uh, there is a specific set of misconfigurations, which we unfortunately find fairly frequently in the wild, I can just pop open your, uh, your task manager and I can dump your LSAS right from there. This means that I can now scrape clear text credentials on my computer, not have to load any malware on your computer other than the rat that I already have, and this is going to give me things like our local admin passwords. And occasionally, depending on how the session systems are set up, I may get more credentialed access than that. In this case, I find just-in-time's uh, passwords sitting right there on the computer. This means now I can move laterally. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, test this out on the network. I'm going to RDP to uh, any host that I can. Uh, and in this case, because Justin Time is an admin on the system, I'm able to get myself into one of their, uh, their domain controllers. I've basically got the kingdom at this point. I've, I've got access to everything that I need. 
Now what I'm going to do is fully expand. So uh, I'm going to use, a uh, again, a legitimate toolkit. I'm just going to use the PS Exec toolkit. Shove this remote access trojan out to every computer on the network because, well, I want everything. I don't know where the data really lies on the network at this point, and I want to be able to steal it. So the more access I have, the better. Using something like PS Exec, I can push this to anything on the domain that's going to respond, and I've got the admin credentials to do it at this point. You can see my, uh, my, my list of victim computers growing in the bottom there. Again, we mentioned this is the Conti playbook. Uh, we, we were following right along with the instructions they give to all of their affiliates at this point, including the use of Mimikatz. And they give you uh, some, it's, we didn't translate this, it's in Russian, but they give you some advice on moving these files off of the network to avoid detection. It's a you know, pretty yeah, smart way of going about it. They that. actually get to the point where they tell their um, frontline hackers what to look for, what kinds of files and things like that, which is interesting because like the cases you see where, uh, for example, they're reusing a dirty wallet, often that's because you have a total newbie just following these instructions step by step, not realizing that they need to replace it with a new clean wallet that they've just create that they have just created. Um, so Conti, of course, is operating using the franchise model. So they have these centralized resources, which are then getting distributed to affiliates. We had a conversation with Mark Grenz from Digital Mint at yes. Black Hat this year, and uh, the, he was talking about the use of, uh, of sanctioned cryptocurrency wallets and how he very infrequently sees them. And when he got to the conversation about how amateur hackers will sometimes reuse dirty wallets and they can't actually even pay them a ransom because they're sanctioned by, uh, by, by OFAC, his feeling of disappointment sounded like so palpable <laughs> at that point, just like shaking his head like an angry father or something. Okay, so then uh, just to zip through some of these, the attackers are going to do an appraisal of what they have. They are, often these are not targeted attacks. You know, they're just sending a bunch of phishing emails, and then they're like, "Oh, we have." And um, we'll see that later. I'm doing a talk later today uh, where we study the Move It attack, and the Clop ransomware gang just comes out and says, uh, "Let us know if you've been hacked," because they have no idea what organizations they've actually gotten. So they'll look for PII, they'll look for financial information, they'll look for proprietary information for a couple different reasons. One, because of course. They want to hold you hostage and use that as leverage, but they'll also use that to do things like set the ransom demand. Um, we've had case after case where uh, they clearly have inside knowledge. It's clear that they know the amount of the cyber insurance coverage, and they're willing to negotiate to just below that. Cyber insurance policies are usually very readily accessible in email and places like that. Um, and then they're looking at the finances, and they seem to set uh, the ransom demand based on like a percentage of revenue or a percentage of net income, things like that that. Okay, so, oh, whoops, sorry, meant to be on that slide. Um, so the next phase is that the attackers are going to start spelunking through the files and apps at Hack Me Inc. And what were you looking for, Evil Matt? Whatever we could find, honestly. I mean, we're, we, we don't know, uh, and, and from an attacker standpoint, they, they don't have a roadmap to where your data sits at this point. Uh, this, this is where, I mean, this is a great opportunity for detection, too, because they're going to start making noise. Uh, we're looking for anything that we can possibly find. We're looking for spreadsheets, we're looking for Word documents, we're looking for database files, anything that might contain something valuable to us something we can use to extort you further on down the road. Uh, in this case, because we, uh, we had gotten into a finance person's computer, uh, the local file system actually had quite a bit of, uh, of useful information for us. Uh, not, quite, uh, not quite enough, though. I mean, we, we really want to expand outward from here. Uh, but uh, the next thing we wanted to do was look at the groups that Leah was, uh, was available with. And this is going to give us a little bit more information about the domain specifically. It's going to tell us kind of where we need to go. Uh, where do you think we would go next? If we've got the local file system, if I'm a ransomware operator, we, based on your network experience alone, where am I going to go after I hit your local file system? File, file shares. Where else? Dash storage. I'm going to hit your cloud. That's, that's where I'm going to go next. And this is, again, this is another one of those big trends we're seeing. Peanut butter and jelly, yeah, exactly. ransomware in the cloud. Yeah, so I mean, if I've got access to your computer, odds are pretty good. You've either got a save session in your browser or you've got a local app that's going to take me to SharePoint. Now I've got access to your cloud system. I've got your entire network. So uh, we, we can just kind of move on from there. Uh, once we had Justin's c credentials, too, we were able to get to his computer, and this is, uh, this is something we've seen in a number of cases. This means I can also get access to something like your Microsoft 365 admin portal. And if you listen to my talk yesterday, that admin portal can be very, very impactful when we're talking about obscuring our, uh, our activities inside of a cloud tenant. We can also do things like change access permissions. I can get access to everyone's shared folders at that point uh, in, the, uh, in the cloud system. It's a bad place to find yourself. So uh, yeah, again, watch out for that one. 
All right, so then they do priming. Priming is when the hackers are getting the environment ready for ransomware to be pushed out. Once they've collected your data, typically this is the next step. And this is also an opportunity to detect them. So, Evil Matt, what did you do to prime the environment? Yeah, so priming the environment is, uh, again, one of those opportunities for detection where we start to make a lot of noise. How many of you guys remember when Holiday Inn got hacked recently? A couple of you. So the, the reason Holiday Inn, uh, they, were, they were hit with a, uh, a data deletion uh, attack instead of a ransomware attack. And the reason that happened was because the attackers couldn't figure out how to get their ransomware to run. Uh, mainly that's because of security software and other controls on the network. If I've got admin access, I can kneecap those controls. So right now I'm pushing out some group policy objects. They, they're uh, going to turn off things like file access control and uh, antivirus software. This means I'm just going to have a more clear path towards uh, completely compromising the network as a whole. And this should be sending up yeah. alerts. It absolutely should. Yeah, new GPO should should totally alert you that something uh, something is going wrong. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do is enumerate the file server. I'm going to look at all the shares that I uh, I have access to, and I am going to uh, then change those file permissions to give myself or anyone else access to that. That means when I dump my ransomware executable, I can hit absolutely everything, and uh, this is going to uh, again maximize my impact. The next thing I'm going to do is create my own account on the system. So right now I've compromised a domain admin, I've compromised a standard user, I've got a remote access Trojan sitting out there, but what if I'm discovered? What if somebody realizes that account's been compromised and they change the password? Well, I'm kind of locked out of the system at that point and I don't want that. So instead I'm going to make myself the radmin. Uh, and uh, I, I Try to pick up a, a more uh, you know smart assy name to, to put on there, but this one seemed to work pretty well. Uh, but yeah, this this means that now I have my own persistent admin access to the network. And if, as we've seen a lot of cases, uh, I detonate ransomware and the IT staff just rolls back to right before the ransomware hit, they might be restoring my account again, so I can just get right back into the network. A very common thing that we see. Uh, so now I've got my own admin access. I've opened up the shares for everything, and it's time for us to probably steal some data before we uh, before we encrypt everything, right? So how are we going to do that? Well, again, we're going to use some legitimate software to do this. I don't want to. Uh, I, I don't want to set off any big alarm bells. So if I uh, if I don't need to use my my Trojan to steal data, uh, I will uh, I will go for something like R clone. And uh, R clone we see very frequently as a uh, as a uh, you know pretty common addition to an attacker's toolkit. Uh, one of the things that's nice about it is it's very easily customizable. It can link directly up to a cloud shared folder, and it staggers the actual upload of data. So this isn't going to set off any usage alarms. We're not going to see any big bandwidth spikes. Very kind of sneaky way of pulling data out of the network. Uh, if I'm not worried about that, I can actually just use the rat that I already have on the system and, and pull data that way. But it's going to be a judgment call on my part there. And then we went to the dark web to pick out our ransomware. Exactly, yeah. We, we wanted to detonate some ransomware. And when we when we looked for a ransomware, what I really wanted to do was make this basically ransomware for dummies. Uh, what kind of ransomware strain can I grab that's going to automate most of these processes for me? I want to just be able to double click this and go. So we, uh, we did some searching. We went through Alpha Bay. We went through Versus. We went through the Cypher market. And uh, we settled on the Dharma ransomware strain. Now, uh, Dharma, if you're not familiar with it, is, uh, is, is a lower dollar ransomware, but they go in high volume. This is kind of the Gancrab method of, uh, of ransomware. They kind of shotgun blast this out to anyone who they can get as a, a victim. They charge a reasonably low cost, and they just work on volume to actually make their money. And they're, they're very successful. Uh, with Dharma, you're looking normally at about $5,000 per computer that they, uh, they encrypt. So if they get your file server, five grand to get that back, and they're, they're out the door. But it, uh, it automatically ruins a lot of things for us inside the network. The very first thing it does is delete uh, shadow volume copies. This means that after the ransomware executes, uh, I can't go back to a previous version of that file and get around the encryption. This is very common. Uh, almost all ransomware does this at this point in time. And you can see the, uh, the threat indicators. This is from the MITRE ATT&CK framework uh, down below. The next thing it's going to do is kill some annoying services. So it's going to stop things like your, uh, your print spooler. It's going to stop things like your SQL service uh, uh, VSS writer. Uh, and it's going to uh, get the environment into a position where I can encrypt pretty much everything on the network. If some of those services are running, files may be locked. I may not be able to, uh, to hit them. So we want to make sure that won't happen. Then Derma also automatically does anti-forensics, yeah. which I think uh, makes our job very hard. But you can see it right here that they clean out the event logs automatically. There's really nothing manual that Evil Matt had to do. Oh, no, no. Yeah, I, I hit start on this one, and it just did all the work. For me, Boom, they're gone. Kind of frightening. Uh, the other thing it did was search the network, find all the shares that were available, mount those shares, and encrypt the files in those shares. And it did this first before it actually encrypted the local file system. Uh, normally, this is done to avoid detection because if a user's sitting at their desktop and this executes, and their desktop files get encrypted all of a sudden, they're going to know something's wrong. If their shared files get encrypted, that's going to take them a little bit longer to identify, and I've got a better chance of completing that encryption cycle. So that's, again, why that order of operations runs in the way it does. 
We're seeing uh, ransomware get faster and faster, and one of the techniques that the criminals are using to make sure it's um, extremely fast is that they're not even bothering to encrypt your whole file in a lot of cases. They realize if they just do a partial encryption of your QuickBooks database or whatever it happens to be, um, that you're going to be dead in the water at that point, and it's going to be very difficult for you to reassemble things. Um, so that is a trend that we're seeing. Splunk did a great research study where they took different ransomware strengths, and LockBit adver was advertising itself as the fastest ransomware strain you can get. And so they were like, okay, is there truth in malvertising, which I thought was kind of cute. <laughs> Turns out there is. Um, in the case, so they, uh, they set up 53 gigabytes and 100,000 test files and they timed it to see how long it would take the different ransomware strains to go through it. And what we, they found was that LockBit, uh, the median duration was five minutes and 50 seconds. And the fastest time that it had was just a little over four minutes. I mean, that is impossible to respond to if it's gonna be less than five minutes for ransomware to encrypt um, over 50 gigabytes of data. That's really ripping through your network. And that's again, because of that partial encryption strategy. All right, so then once they've primed your environment, they've gained their leverage, whether it's through exfiltration or through uh, affecting the availability of your information, then they're going to extort you. So this is a, um, I think this is a LockBit ransomware note, is that right, Matt? No, this is our Dharma ransomware note. Oh, this is our Dharma ransomware strain. Sorry, this was how you <coughs> ended our scenario. Yep. Yeah. So your files are encrypted. Don't worry, you can restore them all. There's a cool skull. This is another ransomware gang that we worked with, the Vice Society. And these guys were great because they were very, well, not great. They were evil. Um, but they were very verbose. They wanted to explain why they were there. They wanted to have relationships with journalists. So I wanted to show you a few examples. First, there's the victim portal, of course, where they just list all their victims. That's become standard on the dark web. And then here's a section for journalists. Um, if you're a journalist and want to ask some questions, they say write to them, and they're trying to get back to everybody within 24 hours. A lot of these ransomware gangs appear to have like professional PR folks <laughs> that are uh, watching their emails and responding on a regular basis. They had an FAQ on their website. Um, how did you decide to team up and start a dedicated ransomware group? Group of friends that were interested in pen test. We decided to try it. That's funny. That's how I started my company, too. <laughs> um, can you explain your decision to publish a certain company? company's data, they didn't pay. They're just very black and white about this one. So anything else you want to add, Matt, about the extortion piece? No, no, I think we, we covered basically everything we wanted to go into. Yeah, they're getting, they're just very professional about it. And that's the bottom line here. Um, you know, we looked at some st some financial statistics early on and talked about the fact that ransomware gangs are making more and more money. Uh, but the amount of money that they make has consistently been underestimated. A couple years ago, if you looked at some of the blockchain analysis reports, um, like uh, the Bitcoin ledger and things like that, we were estimating about 400 as an industry, about $400 million in ransomware payments. And then the Russia-Ukraine war came out, and the hackers hacked themselves. They had a big internal conflict within Conti. You can see that on the screen here. Um, and so, glory to the Ukraine, they dumped out 150 cryptocurrency addresses. So all of a sudden, boom, we know what addresses Conti is using. We can calculate the amount of money that we've been making. And what we found was, at the time, they had made up to $2.7 billion worth of Bitcoin. That is one ransomware gang, and that was eye-opening because it dwarfed all prior estimates for the entire industry. So that just shows us how much they're making, and the fact is that they are reinvesting some of that in their businesses. So they're getting increasingly sophisticated. They have ransomware as a service platforms. They have franchise models with very detailed instructions. They have employees. They have contractors. They have public relations teams. They have sophisticated data leak portals. And we need to be not just reactive but also proactive. So we talked about a few of the controls um, that you can use to prevent ransomware. We'd much rather prevent uh, than have to respond to it. Um, if you do want to stop by our booth, we have the top security controls of 2023, an actual handout, not just a wrist out. Um, and that includes things like deploy endpoint protection, cybersecurity training and awareness, pen testing, next gen backups, um, and incident response testing and training. And all of those are now nuanced. It's not just enough to check the checkbox on backups. They need to be immutable backups. They need to not be sitting uh, in, a in a virtualized system. So um, we have a little bit more detail on each of those because it really, the devil's in the details when it comes to ransomware prevention these days.
So with that, I think we actually managed to whip through these slides a little bit early, get you closer to on time. Thank you guys so much. Um, questions? Thanks. We'll take applause and then questions. So when this type, type of thing happens and I have got to call someone to help, what's the fee structure? How does that work? So like employee, endpoints, servers, like how do I get charged for that? So I believe your question is how do you get charged for ransomware response? Yeah. Yep. Okay, so um, in a lot of cases, companies have already set up a retainer with their incident response organization. And it's actually, it, you need to know who you're gonna call ahead of time. You probably wanna understand if you have cyber insurance, um, who is covered under your cyber insurance policy, how you get approval to engage a third party vendor, whether the insurance, you know, exactly how you interface with the insurance company to get coverage for those things. So that's just one thing to think about. Um, and yeah, you may have, uh, if you want 24 seven response, you're probably going to be paying a retainer for that ahead of time because the IR firm will have staff available. Um, otherwise, you just pay by the hour in a lot of cases. Did I miss anything? Uh, no, your incident response plan ideally should have a, uh, an order of operations if something like that hits. So who do you contact first? How do you contact them? Uh, how do you contact them after hours or on weekends? And what is the, uh, what is the next step from there? Yeah. Yes? What is the criticality of having <coughs> a uh, response on retainer versus just reaching out to somebody? Huh. Great question. Uh, do you need to have an IR firm on retainer versus reach out through insurance? You know, honestly, these days I see companies that have an IR firm on retainer, but they haven't checked to make sure they're covered by insurance. And so what happens in, in an incident is that the IR company starts, uh, they're not covered by insurance, the insurance company takes that investigation away, and all of a sudden you're with a company you've never worked with. So it's really important to make sure that those things are harmonized. Um, and sometimes when cyber insurance changes, IT doesn't know security doesn't know, or they don't know the details. It's like, oh yeah, we have a new policy. And um, a lot of the work I've been doing lately is just making sure that incident response plans are being are realistic and are taking into account the cyber insurance piece of it. Yes? For um, small companies, 100 employees, they don't even have an IR plan, they are one IT manager, but uh, ransomware is assessed to be their biggest threat. There's like reporting tools, like you know, uh, CISA has uh, their ransomware reporting uh, yes. page. FBI has their uh, cybercrime reporting website. If they don't, you know, they, they haven't even. They're kind of shocked. They're surprised by an attack. What uh, are there resources like a CISA offering? Resources are just too small potatoes unless they're like critical infrastructure, you know what I mean? Like what, what, what can they do if they're behind the game, they don't have backups? Yeah, what can small businesses do? And every every organization is behind the game, honestly. Yeah. But it's especially hard for small businesses. Um, CISA does have some resources. I'll turn it over to you in a second. But sure. not, to, uh, not to overemphasize this, um, cyber insurance is critical for SMBs, especially breach response insurance. So for those of you who aren't super familiar with cyber insurance, you can get coverage for the cash loss. You can get coverage for business interruption. All those are important pieces for preparing for a ransomware attack. But I think the biggest, uh, most helpful part for SMBs is the breach response support. And certain cyber insurers, not all of them, actually have their own like meta incident response team. So you call them and you say, it's like kind of like AAA, I'm stuck on the side of the road. You call them and say, I'm experiencing a ransomware attack. And they have someone that handles these things day in and day out, jumping in, guiding you through the investigation. You'll probably get a breach attorney assigned to you. Uh, you'll probably get an IR firm assigned to you. And somebody who knows what they're doing is overseeing that. Um, if you don't have cyber insurance, it's a good idea to have like a virtual CISO, a fractional CISO guiding you through that as well. Um, I've had the privilege of working with my, some of my clients in that capacity too. And you know, just having that oversight to make sure that you're crossing the T's and dotting the I's. Um, do you want to speak at all to the CISO resources? Yeah, I'll, I'll speak to that. First off though, just have them call me. We'll, we'll take care of it. Uh, <laughs> there you go. No, when, you're, when we're talking about a response, if you, if you don't have a formalized plan, you don't have a, you know, a big cyber insurance policy or something like that. I mean, it, 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 it seems fairly intuitive when a crime has been committed, but contact law enforcement. Uh, the, the FBI actually has a, a great uh, amount of resources that can be useful for an organization in that initial kind of response phase. They can guide a little bit of the action there. I mean, they're, they're not obviously going to take over and do any remediation, but they can provide some advice on uh, kind of where to go next. And, well, they don't advertise yeah. when they have a decryptor. Yeah, exactly. You know, that might be something that they're keeping close to their vest that they can provide to victims, but uh, law enforcement may not advertise that because they don't want the bad guys to know they have it. Yep. So, any other questions? Yeah, we got one. Do 
Yeah, so you mentioned that you have the help desk uh, ask a person to rebound a one-time passcode and you're trying to reset their password. How do you effectively train your employees <coughs> to not read back one-time passcodes to people on the phone in other circumstances, but do do it in this one specific yeah, so the question is back to social engineering attacks and help desks, and that's a really good point. How do you train employees to read codes only to certain people on the phone? Um, and remember, by the way, we just did a whole in-depth talk on this. Um, if you look at our YouTube channel, it's scams and fraud, um, and so we can really go into depth there. But um, first of all, in the case where your employees or your customers are calling a call center, they should be contacting a number that they already have on file that they trust, as opposed to people who are getting callers from all over the place, right? So it's kind of flipped. Um, if you're calling a number that you know and trust, that's different than when you receive a call and you need to verify that identity. Um, humans are always going to make mistakes, and I think we just be, need to be moving away from phishing-prone authentication. Uh, our federal government has already banned agencies from doing that. Um, and so check out our talk, uh, because we do talk about alternatives. Maybe last question? All right. Cool. Oh, one more in the back. Sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was wondering if someone would notice that. Uh, yes, on slide 14, um, the report, the stats are that government has done zero layoffs, at least in this particular survey. Did you have a question about that? Well, I think it's unlikely that government's going to go out of business, <laughs> and they don't have quite the same issues. Um, obviously, they do suffer, you know, these organizations suffer tremendously, but it's not the same as if, you know, a small health, there was a small healthcare clinic in Florida that got hit with ransomware and had to lay off 50% of their staff because they just literally didn't have the cash flow. Um, and some of these uh, SMBs in particular are already like hand to mouth, uh, paycheck to paycheck, essentially, as a business. And so a disruption of two to three weeks can be devastating for them. So on that happy note, uh, thank you guys so much for coming. We appreciate it. And we'll be at our booth afterwards.